decidedly Christian, distinctly biblical, and just a little bit nuts. This is Squirrel Chatter. And welcome to the Piney Woods, ladies and gentlemen. I am your squirrel, the host, coming to you from the ARN studios, high atop the tallest tree in the Piney Woods. I am sometimes long-winded, but in a good way. It's good to have you with us. It's uh, Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. And this is Squirrel Chatter, a podcast dedicated primarily to the public reading of Scripture and secondarily to my thoughts on various topics of the day. And looking at my monitor, I really need to... We are reading through the entire Bible in the Legacy Standard Bible Translation this year. And this morning, our Scripture reading is 2 Chronicles 22 through 23, 2 Kings 11, Psalm 131, and Matthew 11. And then I kind of want to continue our conversation from yesterday looking at one specific aspect, and that is, you know, the fact that biblical sexual morality works, <laughs> um, as uh, recent studies have clearly shown. So we'll be looking at that. So we'll continue our thoughts on marriage, family, and the church, but we're going to look at the fact that Biblical sexual morality works as... All right, well, Squirrel Chatter is a proud member of the Christian Podcast Community. You can head on over to christianpodcastcommunity.com, check out all the great curated podcasts that are over there. You are sure to find something that's worth listening to. I just noticed that uh, the Truth Be Known podcast has dropped their second episode in their Ten Commandments series. That uh, I still haven't listened to the first one that I am falling behind, but that's just the... Okay, well, let's begin, as is our habit, with the Prayer of Confession from the 1552 Book of Common Prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. And now our prayer for the reading of the word. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place. For the band of men who came with the Arabs to the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, became king. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. For his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. He also walked according to their counsel, and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to wage war against Haziel, king of Aram, at Ramoth Gilead. But the Aramean struck Joram, and he returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which they caused by striking him at Ramah, when he fought against Haziel, king of Aram. And, Ahaz and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. Now the downfall of Ahaziah was from God, in that he went to Joram. And when he came, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom Yahweh had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Now it happened that when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers attending to Ahaziah and killed them. And he sought Ahaziah, and they caught him while he was hiding himself in Samaria. 
They brought him to Jehu, put him to death, and buried him. For they said, He is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought Yahweh with all of his heart. So there was no one of the house of Ahaziah to retain power, uh, retain the power of the kingdom. Now Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son had died. So she rose and destroyed all the royal seed of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth of the king's, the king's daughter took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Joiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah, so she did not put him to death. So he was hidden with them in the house of God six years, and when Athaliah was reigning over the land. Now in the seventh year, chapter 23, now in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and took commanders of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jehoram, Ishmael the son of Johanan, Azariah the son of Obed, Maasiah the son of Adaiah, and Elishaphat the son of Zikri, and they entered into a covenant with him. And they went around Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of the fathers' households of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Then all the assembly cut a covenant with the king in the house of God. And Jehoiada said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign, as Yahweh has spoken concerning the sons of David. This is the thing which you shall do. One third of you, of the priests and Levites who came in on the Sabbath, shall be gatekeepers at the thresholds, and one third shall be at the king's house, and a third at the gate of the foundation, and all the people shall be in the courts of the house of Yahweh. But let no one enter the house of Yahweh except the priests and the ministering Levites. They may enter, for they are holy. And let all the people keep the charge of Yahweh. And the Levites will surround the king, each man with his weapons in his hands. And whoever enters the house, let him be put to death. And be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss any of the divisions. Then Jehoiada the priest gave to the commanders of hundreds the spears and the shields and the small shields which had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he caused all the people to stand, each man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house, around the king. And they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. Then Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, so she came into the house of Yahweh to the people. And she looked, and behold, the king was standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the commanders and the trumpeters were beside the king. And all the people of the la land were glad and blew trumpets, the singers with their musical instruments leading praise. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Treason, treason. Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the commanders of the hundreds who were appointed over the military force and said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her, let him be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, You shall not put her to death in the house of Yahweh. So they laid hands on her, and when she arrived at the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, they put her to death there. Then Jehoiada cut a covenant between himself and all the people and the king, that they would be the people of Yahweh. And all the people came to the house of Baal and tore it down, and his altars and his images they broke in pieces. And they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And Jehoiada placed assignments concerning the house of Yahweh in the hand of the Levitical priests, whom David had divided by lots to be over the house of Yahweh, to offer the burnt offerings of Yahweh, as it is written in the law of Moses, with gladness and singing according to the order of David. And he caused the gatekeepers of the house of Yahweh to stand, so that no one would enter who was in any way unclean. And he took the commanders of hundreds, 
the nobles, the rulers of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of Yahweh. And they came through the upper gate to the king's house, and they sat the king upon the royal throne. So all of the people of the land were glad, and the city was quiet, for they had put Athaliah to death with the sword. And now second king. Now Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son had died. So she rose and caused all the royal seed to perish. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, who were being put to death, and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid him from Athaliah, and he was not put to death. So he was sit hidden away with her in the house of Yahweh six years, while Athaliah was reigning over the land. Now in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for and took the commanders of hundreds of the Karaites and of the guard and brought them to him in the house of Yahweh. Then he covet a, cut a covenant with them and had them swear on the house of Yahweh and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you shall do. One third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house, one third also shall be at the gate of Sir, and one third at the gate behind the guards, shall keep watch over the house for defense. And two parts of you, even all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of Yahweh for the king. And you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hands, and whoever comes within the ranks shall be put to death. And be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. So the commanders of hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the, prince, or the priest. Then the priest gave to the commanders of hundreds the spears and small shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of Yahweh. And the guards stood, each with his weapons in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house around the king. And he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Then Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people. And she came to the people at the house of Yahweh. And she looked, and behold, the king was standing by the pillar, according to the custom, with the commanders and the trumpeters beside the king. And all the people of the land were glad and blew trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. And Jehoiada the priest commanded the commanders of hundreds who were appointed over the military force and said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her put to death with the sword. For the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of Yahweh. So they laid hands on her, and she arrived at the horse's entrance of the king's house and was put to death there. Then Jehoiada cut a covenant between Yahweh and the king and the people, that they would be the people of Yahweh, also between the king and the people. And all the people of the land came to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images they broke in pieces thoroughly, and they killed Matin, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priests appointed overseers over the house of Yahweh. And he took the commanders of hundreds, and the Karaites, and the guards, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of Yahweh, and came by the way of the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land were glad, and the city was quiet, for they had put Athaliah to death with the sword at the king's house. Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. Now Psalm 130. O Yahweh, my heart is not exalted, and my eyes are not raised high, and I do not involve myself in great matters, or in matters too marvelous for me. Surely I have soothed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, wait for Yahweh, from now until forevermore. And now Matthew chapter 11. Now it happened that when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his twelve disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John in prison heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples 
and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now as these men were going away, sorry, it should be sure it's Matthew. I wrote down Matthew chapter 11 and that is incorrect. Matthew chapter, it's good to know the memory isn't that bad. But I did that. Hey, Monday, I wrote down the wrong date. So my, my little cue cards are not infallible and inerrant. <laughs> Scripture is infallible and inerrant. My cue cards are not. Matthew chapter 8. Now when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and was bowing down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priest, and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not good enough for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began waiting on him. Now when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were ill, in order to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases." Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and allow the dead to bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves, but Jesus himself was sleeping. And they came to him and got him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you so cowardly, you men of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And the men marveled and said, What kind of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. And when he came to the other side into the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What do we have to do with you, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at the distance from them. And the demons began to plead with him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And coming out, they went into the swine, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Now the herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, included what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. 
says the word of the Lord. Now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now the collect for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. So I said I wanted to kind of continue our discussion from yesterday, hopefully without being quite as long-winded. Uh, if you don't get the joke, uh, a friend of mine on Gab made a comment that, that yesterday was a great episode. And I said, well, I thought I rambled a bit. And he said, you were long-winded, but in a good way. So that's what I'm laughing at. All right. Biblical marriage. Biblical sexual morality, it works. Now, clearly, without going into to looking at the scriptures themselves, biblical marriage is virgin until married, having sex only with one's spouse, boys marrying girls, girls marrying boys. So virgin until married, marry someone of the opposite sex, only have sex with that person, two people bound together in marriage until death. That's the biblical model of marriage and sexual morality. See, the, the whole thing about sexual morality is that, you know, okay, if all you're doing is, you know, if you're a virgin until you're married and the only person you have sex with is your spouse, then... You know, you are following the biblical model of sexual morality. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the marriage is the only legitimate outlet for human sexuality. And that's by design. That's the way God made us. And since at least the 60s, with the sexual revolution and primarily I think with the advent of um, the pill, you know, a, a, a reliable birth control, sexuality was separated from marriage and childbearing. So that the, the, the whole idea of quote unquote recreational and it's affected generations. To the point where now, you know, cohabitation is normal and the delaying of marriage is normal. So that, you know, the average age of first marriage now is 30, where 50 years ago it was 1920. So... When we look at marriage, you know, people are delaying marriage longer. Well, delaying marriage does nothing for the sex drive. So at a time when God has designed people to be married and to be experiencing sex with their spouse, people are not married. So they're seeking that sexual experience elsewhere. And this causes huge problems. Everybody's talking about monkeypox now, but all the studies show that you know who is susceptible to monkeypox? The men who have sex with other men, men who have sex with multiple other men. Those are the people that are getting monkeypox. If you're not sleeping with multiple men, you're probably not going to get monkeypox. Like, really unlikely. 
So, you know, that's just the way that is. So all of the, the sexually transmitted diseases, all of that, you know, would stop if people only had sex with their spouses. All right. This is an article from National Review from July 17th, so just a few days ago. The traditional model of marriage, not always honored in practice, but as the societal idea, ideal, was to marry young without living together first, and with the aim of a lifetime commitment. The supposedly sophisticated critique of this model, uh, I just own, and yes, my email alert is the old AOL, you've got mail. My phone is silenced, that won't happen again, I apologize, I'm usually better than that. Back to the article. The supposedly sophisticated critique of this model, model has argued that young people should do other things besides form families, that one should try on multiple relationships first, that 21 to 25-year-olds aren't mature enough for lifetime commitment, and that living together first is a good test run of whether the relationship will endure. As sociology professor and National Marriage Project director William or W. Bradford Wilcox explains. However, his latest empirical study, along with demographer Lyman Stone, supports the traditional view, not that of its critics, at least among religious Americans, who may start off with the advantage of taking marriage more seriously in the first place. Then there's a block quote. Our analysis indicate that religious men and women who married in their 20s without cohabitating first have the lowest odds of divorce in America today. I'm going to repeat that sentence. Our analysis indicates that religious men and women who married in their 20s without cohabitating first have the lowest odds of divorce in America today. We suspect one advantage that religious singles in their 20s have over their secular peers is that they are more likely to have access to a pool of men and women who are ready to tie the knot and share their vision of a family-focused life. In other words, finding your spouse in church seems to work well. Today, young singles like this are often difficult to find in the population at large. That's laughable. Shared faith is linked to more sexual fidelity, greater commitment, and higher relationship quality. Shared faith is linked to more sexual fidelity, greater commitment, and higher relationship quality. One Harvard study found that women who regularly attended church were about 40% less likely to divorce. The family-friendly norms and networks found in America's churches, mosques, and synagogues make religion one of the few pillars of strong and stable marriages in America today. Many young adults today believe cohabitation is also a pillar of successful marriage. One reason why more than 70% of those who marry today live together before marriage. But the conventional wisdom here is wrong. Americans who cohabit before marriage are less likely to be happily married and more likely to break up. Couples who cohabitated were 15% more likely to get divorced than those who did not, according to our research. A Stanford study cited other research, finding that the link between cohabitation and divorce was especially strong for women who cohabitated with someone besides their future husband. So if you're the second or third guy to shack up with her and you decide to get married, chances are you'll end up divorced. Psychologist Galena Rhodes, who studies young adult relationships, agrees that this could be, reason, this could be one reason multiple cohabitations are risky for marriage, but also has other theories on the demerits of multiple cohabitations for future marital success. We generally think that having more experience is better in life, she says. But what we find for relationships is just the opposite. More experience with different partners is linked to worse marriages in her research. Having a history with other cohabitating partners may make you discount the value of your spouse. Sure, your husband John is dependable and a great father, but not nearly as charming or Luke or as ambitious as Charles, the two other men you lived with before marrying John. 
Making comparisons like these could undercut your marriage in Rhodes' estimation. The conventional wisdom holds that spending your 20s focused on education, work, and fun, and then marrying around 30 is the best path to maximize your odds of forging a strong and stable family life. But the research tells a different story, at least for religious couples. Saving cohabitation for marriage and endowing your relationship with sacred significance seems to maximize your odds of being stable and happily married. So that's National, National Review's take and this, uh, excuse me, National Marriage Project research that was put out. So when we think of that, you know, it just goes to show, the statistics show, that God was right. His plan works best. Isn't that shocking? Who would have thought? that God who created us might know what's best for us. So we need to begin to really stress again, because many churches, and this is, this is a sad, sad thing, the statistics show that many churches are perfectly acceptable of cohabitating couples without confronting them with their and. We need to get beyond that. Now, I'm not saying, as I heard one story, tragic story, young man was living with his girlfriend, and they, the young man and the girlfriend were visiting his family, and they all went to church together. Obviously, the church knew of the situation because of what happened. It's a pastor threw out whatever sermon he had planned for that morning and preached on sexual immorality, calling out by name this young man, not a member of the church. And, of course, the man got up, left the church, and has not come back. Now, confronting people with their sin is important, but there's a time and place. And the thing is, when you look at Matthew 18... Calling somebody out before the church is among the final steps of church discipline. If this pastor really wanted to help this young man and this young woman see the error of their ways, he would have requested a private meeting and not called them out. By the time you call somebody out in front of the church, church discipline has progressed down the line. And probably this couple knew that his parents were not happy with their cohabitating, but at the same time, that was not the way to do it. <laughs> so that's, not, you know, so when I say that churches need to begin teaching and stressing the, uh, the, the sanctity of marriage and biblical marriage and biblical sexual morality, it, it shouldn't be done like that. The way to take care of it is to teach it as it is in the scripture and not call anybody out in the congregation. Let the word do the work in their heart. And, and there's a, there, one of the things that I always come back to is when it talks about confronting people who are in sin, one of the things that the Bible stresses over and over and over again about confronting is it needs to be done patiently and gently, not harshly and condemningly, patiently and gently. You look at a 25-year-old young person today living in America, living with their girlfriend or living with their boyfriend, who we hope is at least of the opposite sex. They have received 20 years of societal conditioning because, like I said, since the 60s, since the sexual revolution of the 60s, this has been the norm in American society. The, the, I, I mean, couples cohabitating, when I was a kid, that was still referred to as living in sin. 
That's back during the 70s. It became more common in the 80s, but even then, quite often, couples weren't living together. They were sleeping together, but they weren't living together. Really took off in the 90s, the, the whole cohabitation thing. Really became just commonplace. Nobody batted an eye when a couple lived together. And now, it's the norm of couples in their 20s living together. And so when you look at a young person today who is living with their boyfriend or girlfriend, you are dealing with somebody who's been conditioned by society, by their, their peers, their teachers, their entertainment, their music, the, the, the you know, lives of celebrities, whatever. They are dealing with what they consider to and to move them from that spot, we will have to be patient and gentle. Yes, we say it is sin, but we, we don't say it is sin harshly. Now, there are times when the, the raised voice and the harsh rebuke is necessary. But the vast majority of the time, that's aimed at false teachers, not their victims. And yes, anyone who teaches something contra to the biblical norm is a false teacher. They don't have to be a Christian. They don't have to even claim to be a Christian. But the fact that they teach something that's contrary to Scripture makes them a false teacher. And... and so we do have, they are wolves, and they need to be rebuked, and, and our people need to be protected from them. But having said that, you know, the, their victims need to be treated gently. And, and, you know, I'm not, this is not the case of being winsome, you know, that, 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 that horrible, horrible uh, argument that's gone out there. But patiently and gently is perfectly scriptural. And so you call it out as sin, patiently, gently, privately, at, but at the same time, we need to firmly, in our pulpits and in our Bible studies and in our Sunday school classes, in our youth groups, we need to be proclaiming faithfully and firmly what the world what the word says about marriage so we need to teach the bible faithfully and firmly because we're dealing with a society that is teaching contra to that and i often tell people and they think i'm joking but i'm not i often tell people that i my attitude towards dating, sex, and marriage, and love, and romance was shaped largely by the love boat, which went on the air when I was 11. And I watched it every Saturday night. Our family sat down and watched the love boat. And as we're watching the love boat, I don't remember, now my parents were good and godly people who took us to church every week and dad was a music leader and, and a deacon in the church and, you know, mom ended up in her retirement teaching Bible study fellowship. Good and godly people. But we would sit down every Saturday night and watch the love boat and they never took the opportunity to say, okay, those two, that couple that just went into the cabin, that's sinful. That should be waited. They should wait until marriage to do that. There's your opportunity. It was never taken. Now, I'm not coming down on my parents. Like I said, yesterday would have been dad's birthday, and I miss both of them greatly. But just want to point out, you know, there was a teaching opportunity there that they didn't take. 
And much of my attitude, you know, you could meet somebody on a three-day cruise from L.A. to northern to the coast of, to the Mexican coast and back. You could meet somebody, fall in love, and be sleeping together in three days. You know, that was the you know, actually, let's follow the uh, the plot line that was common on the show. You'd meet somebody, fall in love, sleep together, break up make up, get back together, and be happy when you got off the boat <laughs> in three days while well, going from L.A. to Mazatlan. And, oh, yeah, not a realistic show. Uh, saved the cruise industry, interestingly enough. The, the cruise industry, which I don't know has yet recovered from COVID and the, the, the problems that they've been having, but at the time, in the early 70s, the cruise industry was just about done. And then Love Boat came on. And Love Boat made it cool to go on cruises. And absolutely saved the cruise industry. And the popularity of cruising between then and now rests largely on that TV show. And it was a fun show but not the place to get your ideas about romance, which sadly I and many others of my... So, you know, think about what you're exposing your kids to. If I was a parent in the 70s, knowing what I know now, would I let my kids watch The Love Boat? Would we watch it as a family together? Maybe. It's a fun show. But I would take the opportunity to show my children the error of the sexual relationships that took place regularly on the show. It's kind of like I, I, when my daughter was a teenager and I finally let her watch The Terminator. We watched it together. Now, Terminator is one of the best movies ever made and probably the best time travel movie ever made. Speaking about the original. And just a fantastic story, great plot, and everything. But as we watched it, we talked about the fact that the I do not approve of the language use in the movie. And I didn't approve of the main characters sleeping together. Now, I told my daughter that if she was ever being chased by a homicidal robot from the future, she could use those words, and I would not be mad at her. But other than that, those were words that need not be used. <laughs> so that was my take on that. But I, I you know, there, that's probably, there are probably a thousand teaching opportunities I let slide by, but that, that's one I took. <laughs> You know, if you're ever chased by a homicidal robot in the future, you can use the language that uh, that uh, Linda Hamilton used as Sarah Connor in the movie. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's Squirrel Chatter for today. Got a couple of quick announcements. Tomorrow, of course, will be Theology Thursday. And then tomorrow night, up in Kalispell, we are beginning a study of the book of Ephesians. I will be leading a study of the book of Ephesians beginning tomorrow up in Kalispell. So if you are in the Kalispell area and you would like to attend that Bible study, it's, it's going to be 6.30 to 8, email me at squirrelchatter at protonmail.com and I will get you the information of where to be. Um, so that's tomorrow night in Hamilton, beginning a study of Ephesians. Email me squirrelchatter at protonmail.com if you are in the area and would like to attend that study, we'd love to have you. we got plenty of room, so let me know. And uh, other than that, have a great Wednesday. Remember, please, to do the things you ought to do. Don't do the things you ought not do. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of the Lord. We'll see you again here tomorrow for another episode of Squirrel Chatter. Take care. God bless. Squirrel Chatter is recorded in front of a live studio hamster.